I'm Mary Swenny and I'm Head of Business Development for Researcher, which is a discovery app. Prior to that, I spent over 20 years in academic publishing. Um, our panellists are, well, I'm going to ask our panellists to actually introduce themselves, so that'll be the best thing. So, Roger, would you like to introduce yourself? Professor Jones? No. Let's move on to the other one. Dr. Liu, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, this is uh, Xiangjun Lu uh, from New Jersey, uh, from New York, uh, USA. And I'm a research scientist at Columbia University. Um, I've published near 50 papers in peer reviewed articles. So I work in bioinformatics to develop software to analyze three dimensional DNA RNA structures. I have been a user of researcher. Uh, paper finder, I find it very useful. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Jonathan, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, my name is Jonathan Kramers. Um, I finished my PhD in chemistry at the University of Oxford, and I have published about 12 to 15 papers. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yin Yin Liu, and I am an internet doctor. That does not mean, unfortunately, I have special powers to fix the internet when it's broken. Uh, it means that I have a PhD from the Oxford Internet Institute, which is primarily a social sciences faculty for the exploration of online phenomena. And my PhD was on the rhetoric and resonance of Brexit tweets. Hi, I'm John Baker. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Kent in electronic engineering. Roger, are you there? No, we can't hear yeah. you. Oh. So just a few housekeeping things before we start. Um, we have received some questions from um, the participants. So thank you very much for those. And we will be asking those on your behalf. Um, if you would like, to ask a question, um, please raise your hand or type your question in the chat box. So today we'll be loosely following the author journey. Um, the questions to begin with will start around the pre-submission and journal selection process. So the first question I would like to ask the panel today is what factors influence your decision to publish in a particular journal? So I'll direct that question at Jonathan, if I may. Um, so for me, it was actually always pretty straightforward um, in that we almost exclusively look at impact, at impact factor. Um, so of course you look for a journal that is relevant to your research. You're not just going to a random journal that has an impact factor. Um, but we were definitely aiming as high impact as we could. It was mostly in the second choice. So if you try to submit a paper to a journal and they would reject you, but impact factor became slightly less relevant. At that moment, we would mostly look at the ease of actually rewriting your manuscript and getting it submitted to another journal. So if you, for example, look at two of the, the top journals in chemistry, you would have Jackson and Guant next to each other. Um, and you would usually try to submit to one of them, but if you would get rejected, you wouldn't try the other because there would be too much rewriting involved. And um, so you'd usually step down in impact factor. Um, but the main, the main things that I looked at was the higher impact, the better. I have a slightly different approach to that, I may. So as a social scientist and a humanist, I care a lot about people and communities as opposed to just looking at numbers. Numbers are important, impact is important, but to me, how I, how would, I would choose uh, where to publish is where I'm actually citing at the moment. So I look at um, journals that are publishing papers that I read and I cite, and I want to have that audience so that pretty much covers relevance and also impact because people that I like tend to be relatively high impact individuals so it kind of goes hand in hand with impact but i'm approaching from the, from the uh, perspective of the actual community uh, itself 
Okay, thank you. Dr. Liu, do you have any um, perspectives on this? Uh, actually, to me, you know, the choice uh, is actually quite obvious. Uh, I just tried some of the traditional journal in my field, why NAR nucleus research from Oxford uh, United Press, uh, which is nucleus is with my field and have a very good impact factor. It's very well known in this field. I passed most of my public in over there. I also sometimes try some other journal, for example, Nature or Science or something. That normally, maybe it got, did not got reviewed and then transferred to some other sub journals, which could be wasted a lot of time. Later on, I just said that just target routing very specific to my field and then go from there. It worked very well. Okay. Instead of aiming too high for this, you know, face your nose. Okay, thank you, John. As an early research career, you probably have a different perspective on this. Yeah, uh, I listen to my supervisor. You listen <laughs> so, to your supervisor. For, for journals, he typically recommends looking at the higher impact factor based ones, but there's also conferences as well. There's something called the core ranking. Um, so if you look at them, so he recommends to uh, always pick something which is A star um, because his name has to be on the papers as well and he wants them to be the best. Um, just to let you know, uh, Professor Jones is back on the call. So oh, great. Okay. So Roger, okay. we were just... Can you, we were just, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. We were just discussing what factors influence your decision to publish in a particular journal. Well, I think while I was a more active researcher, um, impact factor was the dominant consideration, uh, even though, of course, uh, impact factor is a, a journal metric, not an individual paper metric. Um, but I think over the last few years, there's an increasing realisation that uh, impact measured in other ways is becoming more important. So, for example, in the research excellence framework in the UK, quite a proportion of the funding uh, allocation is related to the impact story that you can tell uh, about your research so that impact factor alone uh, is no longer the, the main uh, or the sole metric and people are looking I think at journals which are um, more relevant uh, to their research uh, mission uh, and also which are more likely to promote their research uh, in a way that enables them to tell a clearer impact story so I think things are changing um, so that potential authors are interested in alternative metrics, uh, alternative measures of impact, and the extent to which their research is promoted by their target journal. Okay, thank you. And that was partly um, Zoe Anderson from IOP Publishing. Thank you very much for submitting your question. And her question related to your answer, Roger, which was, you know, do you see the importance of the impact factor shifting in favour of alternatives. So, um, Ian, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I definitely endorse what uh, Roger just said. I think impact factor will always be important, but its importance is being eroded over time uh, by the broadening of definition of impact. So to me, I'm doing quite contemporary research on something that's happening at the moment, Brexit. Uh, it is important to have my research be cited by a wide range of individuals, the public, uh, to be mentioned in policy reports, to influence that. So um, that broader societal impact to me personally and to people in my field is as important as traditional impact factor. Jonathan. Um, so what I would say to that is that in chemistry, it seems more and more relevant to look at older metrics as well, such as, such as old metrics. Um, and people have become slightly more active on other social media as well. Uh, but this seems to be quite a recent development in chemistry. Um, so even though I do believe it will become more important, it still very much feels like a nice to have, whereas impact factor is a thing that at this moment still sort of like is the main factor. And Dr. Liu, what do you think about the shifting in favour of alternative metrics? Yeah, I still think impact factor is uh, important in a way that is the number so that everyone can see. 
uh, is a sort of object in the sense is uh, the number of people. But more and more, I feel like I realize the most important part is not the journal you publish, it's the journal impact. And this is people wise, you know, person wise, you know, you, how many people cited your paper? And this kind of citation, uh, especially not self citation, it's very important. That's the whatever quality, that measure the quality of your publication and your impact. That's value most to me. Okay. If I just add something to that, Mary, I mean, I think the interesting mathematics are if you look at the number of citations that contribute to a, an impact factor and compare that to the number of, di di of digital hits, downloads, click throughs, full text downloads, it's, a, it's, a, it's several orders of magnitude greater. So mm -hmm. digital attention um, makes the impact factor citation numbers pale into insignificance. And I think one of the challenges is going to be to capture that uh, in a useful way as a measure, uh, as a, tr a truer measure of impact. Just one small thing to add to that is that these sort of measures, such as views and how viral something goes on Twitter, is also there's a danger of clickbait in that. While an impact factor, if it's a citation, if people are actually citing your work, to me still feels like a higher relevance of your work. Mm. That, and if you've managed to advertise it well through tweets and Facebook. Okay. Yeah, that actually come to another aspect because I'm working, I'm writing a software to analyze data, you know. I do not have many publications in, uh, uh, in the sense that I, I develop more, develop more at a time, develop a software. People, a lot of people use my software with my website, but that kind of thing is not acceptable in the traditional sense. That's not covered by the impact factor. And especially in this, uh, you know, internet age, how to, you know, mix that, that kind of contribution into account, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something I think uh, should be considered. Mm. Okay, I have a message here from Tommy Doyle, who says, aren't all metrics just a form of social exhaust measurement? Um, is it dangerous to assess research quality and impact based on popularity. Does popular research equal good research? So actually, I think all metrics, um, if you ask them, if you speak to them, they're saying that they're not there to measure impact, to measure, they're measuring exposure. Um, they even had a better word for it that of course has come to my mind right now. Um, but they're actually really trying to say like, we're not impact, we're just, say, we're just showing how widespread the research is being wrapped. Um, so they are trying to make a slightly different metric than the uh, the metrics we're using generally. Yeah, I think I think that's that's partly true. But I mean, for example, in take for example health sciences research, if you look at the journals in which health um, health services research can be cited, um, they are you know, the peer reviewed literature, but the reality is that health services research, which affects policy, is more likely to be cited and to be used in things like clinical guidelines, which may be more local, will not be necessarily peer reviewed, and fall into that, that gray literature area. Now, I like the idea of the social exhaust, but this is quite a dense exhaust. This is, this is the way that research is taken up in practice, and that's, that is better captured in alternative metrics, and it's not captured at all in the impact factor because this is not the peer-reviewed literature but this is important literature which informs policy development uh, and i think that's that's one of the strengths of thinking of, of, of ways of, of using alt metrics to capture that i'd just like to add a very quick comment to this which i think um we haven't addressed but we were reviewing everything as you know this or this but i think it's an and as opposed to an or exercise that these mm -hmm. metrics have to be viewed alongside traditional measures like impact factor you can't just exclude one for the other and that that gives you the full the best possible landscape as it were it'll still be kind of impressionistic it's not going to be pointillism to use a, an art metaphor but you know it's better than having just one tree You've got lots of shrubs and flowers as well as just a tree also, okay. stuff like impact factor is very slow. It takes months exactly. and months and months, even years, yeah. for that metric to build up. Okay. 
Um, we have another message from um, our callers here, from Dave Evans. Where does the ease of submission and ongoing processing ease, in a technical sense that is, rank as a decision factor when determining to submit? Would a poor submission experience ever put you off submitting again? Jonathan, would you like to answer that? Um, so for me, this, this hasn't ever been a real big factor because um, I came from quite an established research group and that made that group privileged enough that we could just go for the high impact journals without too much, too much of a fight. Um, and in there, you sort of, you accept that, uh, that sometimes it doesn't go as smooth as you would want it to go. I think the moment that you are looking at a much wider range of journals, that would definitely become a factor to look at. And I've definitely heard my professor say at some point that we are avoiding certain journals because it's just a nightmare to, to get it done. I would say, I mean, the ease of use certainly is an important factor. But what's much more important than ease of use of the software is just timing and when I can expect to hear back about comments, when I can expect the paper to be officially published, that publication time cycle um, overwhelms a funky software. Okay, so I'll move on to another question now. Um, that's from Philippa Benson, who's managing editor of Triple I can always get all over this says A A A S. Um, how important is publishing open access to you? How do you balance consideration of OA journal reputation versus APC charge? So I would direct this question to Roger, if I may. Thanks very much. Um, I think it was my cat in the background that. Um, <laughs> Uh, apologies. Um, the uh, I think well, I think Plan S is going to change a lot of this because at the moment it looks as though the requirements of Plan S are actually going to change people's uh, decisions about where to submit their journals if they're if funded by the major uh, national uh, funding bodies and institutions. They will be they have to publish in fully open access journals or journals that are engaged in some kind of transformational relationship. So I think that. Uh, things will change over the next two or three years. Um, but I think the availability of open access is an important consideration at the moment so that hybrid journals benefit from the decisions of publishers, uh, of, of authors, not just of research actually, but sometimes of opinion, of editorial and other material to pay an open access fee to get their material uh, into circulation as quickly as possible. So I think there is a bit of a balance there between uh, characteristics of journals as you as you described. I'd like to add this question as well, Mary. Yeah, cool. um, on a principle matter of principle, because my research was funded ultimately by the public, I feel an oblig a social duty or obligation to give back to the public. And for that reason, I would actually choose an open access journal in my field, like First Monday, Monday or Social Media and Society, over uh, a non-open access journal that has a higher impact, like New Media and Society, just because it can spread my research to more people. Um, so that, that broader sense of impact, societal impact, uh, influencing policy, for example, being cited by tech journalists, that's very important, and I prefer for the entire text to be available. And also to add to that, um, as I am also early career, and uh, at the moment I don't, I don't actually have a belonging to uh, an institution full time, I am aware that most journals have some sort of APC waiver for independent researchers, and so the charge wouldn't actually apply, I don't think, um, in my case, which is good. There's no kind of cost implications of publishing open access. Uh, I think if that's not the case, that depends on where it depends you on the journal. Depends on the journal. But I have seen that some journals it. do waiver it. Um, some new journals do waiver um, the cost to begin with, but the majority of publishers do charge individuals APC and that's your um, um, a country, a sort of um, a, low, a developing country. For our early career, I think there's two there's two categories. Depends on the journal. Jonathan, you want to add to this? Um, yeah, like 
when I was in the period of my PhD, um, I didn't concern myself with open access at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I wasn't even very aware of it. And I think, if anything, in my mind, I was like, oh, if it's open access, that probably makes it a little, maybe potentially not as good journal as the top journals in the field. Um, but actually, especially after my PhD and learning more about it, um, I realized that it's, it's almost silly that so much is behind tables because right now I cannot access over half my papers anymore um, because they're behind tables and I don't have that, that access anymore. Well, while doing my PhD, the paper was never a problem because we just had a VPN connection to get everything. So I think actually now I realize the value a lot more than when I was actually doing research. I think for me as a uh, PhD researcher, there's always a huge concern about the viable process and the places where you publish. And I think with an open access journal, there might be a bit of a stigma that it might not be good enough when you get to the viable that it, your work's in a, in a top place. I'm, my supervisor is always pushing for me to publish in the top places and how it'd be really good in the Viva process to say that it is here, it's been peer reviewed in a top place, therefore it must be really good work and unquestionable. I think open access is always a, a consideration uh, for me. Yeah, to me, uh, the open access generally is a preferred way to publish my work, not only for wide circulation of my work, but also because my funding agency is uh, nice, it, uh, you know, it's very, it has a requirement. All, pub, all published work uh, from a funding agency must be made publicly available. So if it's in a North of X journal, I must submit my accepted version to PMC called PubMed Central, which is another step which could be, could be quite annoying. So overall, I think, you know, open access, uh, you know, is the way to go in the future, at least. Okay. Um, I've had another comment around open access and Plan S. And obviously, Plan S is a sort of a Western European um, coming into play, not so much in the, in the US. So for Chinese and Indian authors, it's not on their radar at the moment. So um, in some other cultures, it's still viewed with suspicion. So would somebody like to take that one? Roger, perhaps? Well, when um, the uh, House of Lords reviewed the report uh, on open access that set this running in the UK, they made this very point that you should be careful what you wish for. Uh, and that many countries um, for whom open access still uh, isn't part of mainstream thinking about publishing, will be deterred from sending uh, material to publishers in the UK. And I think this is still the case. As you say, it hasn't really happened in the UK. Um, I'm not so sure. I think China is a slightly different case. But even, you know, I'm in, in involved in primary care publishing, even in countries with healthcare systems which are very similar to ours, open access fees are not readily available. Uh, for example, in the Northern European and Scandinavian countries, so that open access does create some disincentives and some perverse incentives for international publishing, no question. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, so there's a particular question that I wanted to address to Dr. Liu. Being an established author in your field, would you be willing to publish in a new journal? Are you talking to me? That's for you, yes. Yeah, uh, I certainly would like uh, to consider publishing in, uh, in a new journal. You know, know that you know there's so many new journals uh, appearing, you know, uh, on a very frequent basis. And in my field, there are actually, you know, quite a few are already there. So I, I will certainly consider. Okay. Um, depending on the publisher and the uh, editor in chief of, of this new journal. That's good to hear. And John, how do you go about new research? Um, so, when I started my PhD, my supervisor told me to go on Google Scholar and here are the top papers and to read the citations of the top papers, read the citations of the citations of the top papers. So, I found it quite a tedious process um, by doing it like that. 
And I found other methods such as ResearchGate, I thought was a good one, um, where you can just register your interest and you see similar work that's being published in real time. And that. Um, also, other mediums like uh, Twitter or Reddit, I find them quite good as well because it allows people to comment on the work. So not only do you read the work, but then you can see further discussions. You know, the further discussions are where you can find uh, people linking other work, which is so relevant to it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I use Twitter a lot just because uh, my research is about Twitter, so I kind of have to be on it. And that is one main source, along with Google Scholar recommendations from my supervisor, my peers. Um, another thing is I do read the tech news um, and Journalists do cite papers, so that certainly sources the most visible ones. Um, and yeah, I think it's what's interesting about social media is it's so personal and um, following, you know, authors uh, themselves uh, is great because, you know, you can learn a bit more about their broader personal context. Uh, that will provide some more insight into the paper and also author websites. I do um, have a list of authors that are quite prominent in my field. I look them up on Google once in a while. Um, yeah, my approach um, is more similar to Yin's approach, I think, is where there is a couple of journals that were like the top journals, such as Unwanted Jacks, Major Chemistry, and I would quite occasionally go to the website to see whatever is new on the okay. Um, and on top of that, I had a list of professors that I was interested in, they were close to my work, and I would just go to their academic pages, click on their list of publications, and see what I was up there. Uh, and I would usually use these two places as a starting point. I would just like John sometimes go down the rabbit hole of citations and from citations or references. Um, but mostly I would use these two sources to find my work. So what about Sci-Hub then? Um, I didn't know Sci-Hub existed when I was um, doing my PhD. But after my PhD, when I figured out that uh, I couldn't access my papers anymore, it became um, one of my favorite academic websites. <laughs> Just to add to that, I think, because um, I was writing my thesis, and I, I still am now, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer on campus. And so you realize that you actually have no access to papers. And my university doesn't use uh, a VPN to access papers. You have to go through their library website, which is extremely tedious. Um, so I found myself using alternative things. I think it's, it's based upon on paywall, but it's just ways of finding an open access copy or preprint copy of a paper just so you can actually read the thing. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lou, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, not for little. Okay. I have a quick thing to add to that, for one sentence. Basically, if there's a paper I'm burning to read, I don't have access anymore, um, I would ask a colleague of mine who's still doing a PhD or a postdoc to get it for me. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to work. Okay, Roger, how do you actually find out about new research? Well, I suppose by reading uh, is the main thing, really, just keeping uh, abreast of the of what's coming out in the uh, in the journals, but also in my in my field by going to conferences and very often buttonholing authors uh, who presented um, new material uh, to suggest that they publish in my journals. Uh, so getting out there as well as um, sitting in the office, uh, I'm, I'm very, I like researcher. I like I like the the app that we that we're we're based on here. Uh, so I think there are, and I agree with, the, with everyone's previous comments, I think there are many ways of doing this, but getting out among the research community, uh, I think is important for editors uh, to be aware of what's hot and, and who's, who, who the rising stars are. Okay, so leading on from that question, we have a question from Leanne Elliott of F1000, who's head of communications there. Um, and she was asking about what publishing, discovery, and writing tools, platforms do you, you all currently use? Um, for me, it's actually very basic tools. Of course, I use Word or LaTeX to write my, provide my manuscripts, and I use Antinote uh, as my reference manager. Um, I have used Mendeley a little bit, but Antinote is what I started out with, and I just stuck with it. Um, besides that, are chemical tools, chemical drawing tools, and stuff like that. Like ChemDraw is one of them. Um, but I must say, I didn't actually use as many special tools. John, what about you? Uh, for me, started off, of course, writing in words, and then I was trying to 
write a conference paper and the template that you had to use kept crashing. So my supervisor made me learn LaTeX, which is the one of the most variable things um, I've actually learned in the academic world. Um, and for reference manager, I use RefWorks purely because my university has a license for it. Do you know of a reason? I don't enjoy it too much. Yeah. yeah, I had a, I unfortunately wrote my thesis in Word and it wasn't until the 11th hour prior to submission that my whole thesis crashed in Word and I had to actually delay my submission by uh, 48 hours to be able to reconstitute the entire thing, uh, but it was too late to learn LaTeX at that point. Um, but like Jonathan, I actually err on the side of simplicity and using as few tools as possible. Okay. Yeah, I can uh, maybe join in that. Uh, for, for my collaboration, you know, I use Word and EndNote because other of my collaborators using these tools. Personally, I use LaTeX a lot, you know, with mathematics, with long documents, with, which make life much easier. Because Word, if you're over 20 pages, it's such a pain to use. <laughs> Another uh, reference tool I used recently called Zotero, I can't pronounce it properly. C O T R O. Zotero. This has a very nice web interface. Whenever I go, you know, on the web, I can you know, bookmark it, save in a uh, in a in a link I can reference later, which is very convenient. This is, this is sort of like the way you develop paper finder, which I find very handy. <laughs> Just to add to that, also Overleaf, um, writing LaTeX together in collaboration, I think that's okay. absolutely brilliant. Both working remotely and writing the same documents, so helpful. Okay, thank you. So we we'll move on to some specific marketing questions here. And I wanted to ask the panel, are you receptive to marketing messages sent via email, like general call for papers? or call for papers for collections or thematic series? That's the first part of my question. Yeah. Yes, so I would say it depends on who the messenger is, 100%. So if the messenger is someone I don't know, no. <laughs> As in if it's directly uh, from the marketing manager or the publisher. Uh, but if it's from a colleague of mine, um, the DPhil program director, my supervisor, for example, I would. Um, I've never been particularly receptive to any of these messages. Um, it's also because we just had we had our routine established in a way. We knew what journals we wanted. We knew what the, the conference we're interested in. Um, I wouldn't necessarily ignore them, but I guess also like Yin was saying that if I would get messages from very established new journals from established publishers, I would look into it most likely. Um, well, if it comes from some dodgy source, I would probably just ignore it. Okay, what about sponsored advertising? Um, you know, Google AdWords, Twitter, Facebook? Also, but I think the same, the same holds true there, that if it comes from a source that I find trustworthy, if it comes from, or if the content from the advertising seems relevant to me, I would be likely to click it. I think advertising for me, just as in general, has to be extremely relevant. Like being advertised, Chris doesn't help me. And if they advertise to me a biometrics journal, that's not really helpful to me either. It have to be something that actually catches my eye and makes me want to click it. I would say platform choice is incredibly important here because I'm not in a publishing state of mind uh, when I'm on Facebook or even on doing general Google searches. But because I do uh, look out for new papers on Twitter, that actually would potentially catch my attention. I might click on Twitter, but not other social media or Google. Roger, how do you feel about um, advertising placement on behalf of publishers? Advertising placement on... The publishers actually, you know, sponsoring advertisements in, say, Twitter or on Google. <laughs> I suppose my feeling is that very that top ranked journals probably don't need to do that. Um, uh, and I, I take the point that was made earlier that if you're, uh, as an author, um, confronted with a with a, a special issue of the Lancet or something, you might respond to that. The problem is that most of the special issues that we uh, are invited to contribute to at the moment are predatory journals. Um, I probably had six this morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, to write a paper about a topic of which I know nothing. Um, so I think the whole business of soliciting um, material has got a rather bad name at the moment because of the, of the preponderance of very dodgy uh, approaches from unknown journals. The question is that we have to uh, do have to grapple with though is how does a well-meaning new journal get a, a reputation under these very difficult in this very difficult environment? Mm. If you're launching a Cascade journal, um, which you think will be a useful addition to the to, to the literature. How do you avoid it being regarded, you know, in its early stages or forever uh, as being predatory uh, or, or flimsy? I think there are some difficult questions there about, about new journals mm -hmm. because we've got used to these awful uh, non-existent journals asking us to, to write papers for them. I think, Jonathan, you had a perspective on a particular new journal. You're obviously very traditional in your, you know, going for high impact. Mm -hmm journals in the first place but you did actually say you came across the journal by accident yeah so this is um so this was actually one of the cases where um a lab mate of mine uh, did some work but it didn't quite get the results he was anticipating so uh, with those results it would be very hard to next to impossible to publish in the higher impact journals um but he also wasn't too keen to submit to a low impact journal because he felt that was not really worth it huh? So what he did in the end is that he submitted to uh, CAM, which was at the time a very new journal. It was so new that it didn't have an impact factor. But he believed that there might be a chance that it would grow into uh, a high impact chemistry journal. So he sort of like placed a bet on that journal. And I can imagine that if a new journal comes out from an established publisher um, that I trust, that I perceive as being valuable, um, I could see myself taking a similar gamble. Okay, interesting. Dr. Liu, do you have um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I echo most of the comments from our previous panelists, and I received quite a few such kind of call for papers invite to be editor, you know, special for some special uh, collections or semi, you know. Publishing, so I basically I, I ignore all of them because this is so many of most of them are junk. Unless I receive some invitation from one I, I know of. Okay, thank you for that. Um, moving on, do you think publishers can provide more support to authors seeking funding, um, and especially around grant applications on how to apply for grants? Um, Roger, could you answer that one? Yeah, I would think of that as being slightly outside the scope of our activities, actually. Um, we, it's interesting, people do, I think, have sometimes slightly inappropriate expectations of, of journals, um, particularly in terms of pre-submission um, inquiries and general sort of questions about looking at material that may or may not be suitable. And I, I'm often surprised that the, the potential authors, potential uh, um, researchers who are trying to get into the journal don't discuss these with their own academic institutions, who are much better placed often to give that advice than journals. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that I could add anything to what my, you know, King's College London, where I've got my chair, uh, could the information that the kings could provide. So I'm not sure that publishers and journals are the right place to go to for information about grant applications. I'll add one quick thing to that, which is at my faculty, um, my PhD, the Internet Institute, we had two members of staff who were dedicated to helping the researchers at the Institute uh, apply for funding. And basically, whenever anyone wants to apply for any sort of funding, uh, we have to send a draft of the application to one of these two individuals and they would review it and give edits before uh, we could actually submit. Interesting. Um, I think it, the question arose around um, more the language side of things and help with you know, actually forming the grant application itself. Um, so I think that's where publishers um, have been asked to help out. Um, so we'll move on now to B. 
the expectations of an author and what they actually expect from their editors. And um, I know Roger, you can probably speak from the, from both perspectives here. So it's yeah. good to hear your um, your view on that one from both sides of the fence. Well, I mean, I think that um, authors can, should reasonably expect uh, access to editors. And I think a lot of, a lot of potential authors don't realize this, that actually we're quite keen, very keen to receive pre-submission inquiries about scope, uh, format, uh, and so on. Um, and that's, that's true of research papers, it's true of editorials, it's true of discussion articles. So I think that uh, authors should see um, editors as, as being open to, um, to providing that kind of advice. Um, I also think that authors should have high expectations of editors uh, in terms of the speed and efficiency with which these things are handled. And to go back to some previous comments, I'm certainly aware of one or two journals uh, that people have gone off uh, submitting to because of the length of time it's taken to come to an, uh, even a preliminary decision uh, about uh, acceptance or provisional acceptance. So I think that an efficient um, system of uh, manuscript handling is, is an expectation. And I think the third expectation, and, and I noticed there was a chat comment about this, a few minutes ago is a really top quality peer review system uh, in which the editors uh, ensure that um, the peer reviews that uh, support uh, editorial decisions about acceptance or rejection uh, are not only uh, sufficiently well pre pre presented to justify those decisions but also are constructive enough to help authors to improve their manuscripts for submission to other journals. So those are three areas I think. Uh, of expectation that authors can reasonably have of editors. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Yeah, uh, as an author, you know, I would certainly expect uh, the editors to be more responsive. Uh, and also, just like when you collect reviews, you have a detailed comment, uh, where make a very specific point for the author to make correction or whatever to follow up. Also, I would expect you know, the editor you know, to be more reasonable with a reviewer. Sometimes I review article, no, they, they ask you finish in seven days, in 10 days. So I, I don't know about other reviewers. Normally for me to review article take at least 10 hours, sometimes even two days. I might dig deeply into some of the details. So I would like to have maybe, no, they, they, if after deadline, maybe they immediately, you know, just like ignore you, just like, you know, cancel your review. But sometimes review, reviewer, the editor could be more friendly to the reviewer, even with a couple of maybe a few days, you know, extension. So this is just like an interactive, you know, process where it combined together to make it a better per, uh, experience. Okay, thank you. We, we, we cherish our reviewers, Dr. Liu. <laughs> <laughs> I just like have an experience with some of the journal which I do not name. You know, they have a deadline with uh, 10 days. Yeah. So I finish, yeah, I will, I try to submit it maybe uh, not completely finished. And I will one day or two days later, they have the like decision, sorry, we no, no longer need you. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it's peer review week, um, and we have a couple of questions leading on from your brief discussion about peer review. Um, how do you think we can improve peer review? Who do you want to take that? Uh, well, Roger, you can start. That's fine. Should I, should I make a start? I mean, I, I think peer review has had a bad press over the last few years. Uh, uh, you know, there's a peer review conference every couple of years in Chicago, which spends a lot of time mocking peer review without putting very much in its place. Uh, and I think, as I said a minute ago, that high quality peer review can be very creative. It can turn a, an ugly duckling of a paper into a swan. It's a very powerful force for good in science publishing. Um, I think the argument about open, transparent, single blind, double blind, and all the rest of it uh, continues, and there's no absolutely perfect format for peer review. We use a uh, uh, 
an open peer review system in which the, the identities of authors and researchers are known to each other. And I think that does encourage a more respectful dialogue, but also there are some, some constraints about power relationships I recognize in that, um, in that system. I think editors have got a responsibility to make sure that they look carefully at reviews before they send them out uh, so that uh, they are of sufficient quality and constructivity for authors to benefit from and should get further reviews uh, if they um, aren't, don't meet those criteria. And I think, as I also hinted uh, earlier, editors need to look after their reviewers. I mean, they are the unsung heroes of publishing. I mean, I know authors, you know, reviewers are also authors, and authors are also reviewers. And there's a vested interest, but reviewers, uh, as you, as you said, Doctor Liu, spend hours and hours mm -hmm. doing work uh, for very little more than a bit of academic recognition. And I think we need to recognise that and celebrate it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That there needs to be. I think publishers can play a role in recognising the achievements um, of of reviewers. And the other side of that, um, as an early career researcher, I've been asked to peer review for a journal and I was given no guidelines um, as to how to do it. And I think training is, is also quite important, especially for maintaining quality. Um, and I was basic, I was quite overwhelmed when I received uh, the request because I have had no previous experience with it. And so that I think is a nice intervention that publishers can make the training of uh, more junior researchers into how to properly do a peer review. Yeah, I think the question has just come up about how, how peer review should be recognised. And I think there are many ways of doing this, publishing lists of reviewers, providing certificates for postgraduate accreditation, um, for uh, pr providing feedback, uh, thanking people uh, for uh, doing good quality peer reviews. Not many journals pay peer reviewers, but giving reviewers access uh, to journal subscriptions uh, is a good way uh, of, uh, of recognizing them uh, and um, many journals uh, rate peer reviews uh, and these reviews are available to the to the peer reviewers so that peer reviewers could in an academic uh, appraisal round for example say that they've been rated highly by the following journals for whom they've conducted peer reviews so there, there are a lot of ways of making peer reviewers feel better about the or feel feel, feel good about what they do for journals Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question that's been asked, which is about reproducibility. Um, what can journals stroke editors do to improve reproducibility? Should they play a role or leave to archives and annotations, etc.? Roger, would you like to take that one? Reproducibility of data or of reviews? Um, I would think probably data in this case, but um, Tommy, could you possibly clarify for us? Yes, of data or experiments. Yeah, that's a tricky one because uh, as we know, a, a lot of one-off very influential um, publications, particularly in behavioral psychology, uh, have not been replicated in the subsequent years after they've been published. And you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And I think people do need to be careful about taking the results of a single study. I think that the, the, the science of evidence-based medicine, systematic reviews, meta-analysis has to some extent dealt with that problem that people are much more guarded now about changing clinical or policy behavior on the basis of a single study and often wait for the meta-analysis and, uh, and systematic review uh, before, before behaviour change. So I, I'm, it's, uh, I'm less worried, I think, than the questioner perhaps implies he or she is uh, about, uh, about re replicability and reproducibility. Um, should it not be um, publishers that help um, authors to actually deposit their data and to ensure that you know what the data is published alongside the actual articles or experiments in order to you know build upon science and make sure that it is reproducible because often data sets go missing or in notebooks etc so should the onus be on the publisher the author or both 
Roger, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I think I think it is a I think it's a publisher's responsibility. I mean, I think this can be this can be data sets qualitative as well as quantitative. Actually, interestingly, mm -hmm. should be made available um, by, uh, if possible, by publishers. Um, certainly by authors, uh, authors should be prepared to make them publicly accessible. Uh, so that people can repeat the experiments. Actually, on, on this one, in chemistry, there is more and more trend towards people making their raw data available with the publication. Mm -hmm. And what that means, of course, we, like we make molecules, we characterize molecules, we have a lot of experimental data. And even though it is very difficult to put the whole experimental on there, so all the steps that you've done, you can at least put your characterization data on there because a lot of journals will accept um, screenshots of your data, but it is not particularly hard to open paint and remove a couple mm -hmm. that you don't want to have in your, uh, <laughs> that make you look bad in a way. Um, so uh, there is definitely a move to it also work for this, um, this organization that's sort of like, hey, we want all metadata on there and we want to make sure that somebody can download that, they can open it in their chemical programs and they can see exactly what that data represents zoom in on it, analyze it themselves, um, which is, I think so to some extent, like, I guess I do think that the publishers have a responsibility here to make that data available, but I think that also the authors here should make that available because they shouldn't leave doubt that what they're doing is real. They shouldn't leave doubt that they're lying about something, that they're fudging the truth a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a responsibility on both sides. Um, from my experience, um, I've been doing some work in um, speech recognition. I've been trying to reproduce some people's work just so I can try and improve upon it. I can't at all. So I speak to my supervisor and he tells me it's a known problem that sometimes uh, the papers don't match up or maybe they miss something. But um, when I've been doing machine learning, a lot of people um, deposit their source code in GitHub repository. So you can try this um, straight out of the box and you can press play and it'll run scripts and it'll reproduce exactly how they define it in the, in the paper. And I think that's really useful. I can imagine in a peer review process just attaching this link that the reviewer can press play and do it themselves just to enrich that peer review process could be really handy. I had a similar comment to John actually that, I mean, for my PhD thesis, for example, I put all of my code on GitHub as part of it, part of it was computational. I think in the social sciences, certainly social data sciences, there's a trend towards putting all the scripts uh, online on GitHub. Um, I think the other issue around this is just fuzziness around methodology. And uh, certainly in the social sciences, there is a reluctance to publish detailed methodology sections that would allow for um, the results to be reproduced. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I can maybe comment on this based on my own experience. Uh, firstly, I can really not understand why reproducibility could become an issue at all for scientific publication. So for my experience, you know, I always make my table and the figure, all these details, where I was, uh, where I'm the first author or the credit one, credit also, I always make the details about how the figure and the table are generated with the figure with the paper available on my website. And I think rather than just like place this additional requirement or that requirement. For the party binaries, we should encourage the people who really do reproducible work. Because otherwise, there are so many details in all this process. For example, for software, you have so many parameters, you have so many options. Even give this source code, there are still could some of these things you can manipulate to get different results. So for each publication paper, key figure people in the figure, you should provide the details so other people can verify your result. If you can just like follow this very simple way and hold the first author and the credit responsible responsible for their own publication, this problem should not exist at all from my own appearance. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in relation to what you just said, um, 
Tommy Doyle again has asked, do you actually use stuff like CodeOcean? But you did actually say that you use several different softwares out there. So I think we've covered that one. Um, <clears throat> moving on slightly, I think I want to sort of tackle um, some more marketing questions before the end. So um, I wanted to move on to hear the panel's views about the use of social media um, and how relevant do they find it in terms of sharing their work and findings. That's from the managing editor of the Hearing Journal. So would you like to start with that, Ian? Sure. Um, yeah, my research is on social media, so I have to be on it. Um, researchers in my field are all on it. And so I think it's pretty much if you're not on social media, you are seriously, seriously missing out. Um, and also it's all journalists are. So I have quite a few connections with various um, mainstream and alternative publications. Um, and so uh, they're monitoring, you know, author social media feeds to look for the next paper in real time, as it were, because they need to report things. Um, and so, yeah, I basically have to be on there. And Twitter, I would say, is number one for that. Okay. It's also become increasingly important for authors to promote themselves and their work. Um, how do you currently go about this? Can I give that one to Jonathan? Um, so I think chemistry is still quite traditional. And um, that is not a major thing to go and self-promote too much. Like everybody will have their own academic page on which they of course have the biography and where they have their publication, all these things. Um, but I've noticed in recent years, and this is really only for the last couple of years, I think, that social media is uh, becoming more important, and this is mostly Twitter for chemistry. Um, so now I do see that professors start making a tweet about um, new papers they've published, they make a tweet about conference they're attending, um, and some people are actually taking this quite very seriously, and they have 10,000 of tweets about their everyday life in the lab. Um, but still, I think that the majority of chemistry professors are not actually on this. Um, even though you'll see more and more that they will have a group page which is managed by their group rather than the professors themselves. John? Um, I'm not sure if publishers have promoted my individual papers. Um, I think it kind of went on the repositories like ACM and places like that, and then it's just put behind a paywall. So it's, it's real difficult, I think, for people without subscriptions to those services to read my work. I can't access my work myself unless I'm on the university campus. Um, so I think it could be really useful to actually promote individual papers. Okay. The question is actually more about how you promote yourself and your work. Um, so to supplement this, you post it on um, ResearchGate. You hope you've got a large following number so that they can read it. Also, the university makes some effort as well. They put it up mm -hmm. on their academic repository and um, they send down some newsletters and things like that. I'd like to add two things to this, actually. So I have written before for The Conversation, which is an online publication with a stellar team of editors and they only publish uh, articles from academics, but they edit them in a way that makes them available or readable to a mainstream audience. Um, and that's fantastic because when it's published in the conversation, it can then be republished in the New York Times, the BBC, Wired, Guardian, etc., and reach an explosive um, audience that way. So I think that's quite important alongside social media, that plus maybe writing blog posts about your research. The second thing is we keep emphasizing the online sphere of things, and I love that. But I would also say that events, symposiums, conferences, workshops, all of that is as important as the online aspect of things for self-promotion. Okay. Roger, do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, I think, I mean, I echo what Ian's been saying, really. I mean, we have a very extensive list of uh, media, print and digital that we send, uh, and you know, TV and, and so on, that we send select summaries of papers to. Uh, on a sort of regular cyclical basis. So we probably promote about a third 
of the papers that we publish each month quite vigorously uh, through that those channels and we put a, a tweet about every paper uh, in BJGP, BJGP Open at um, every month as well so that we do a lot with traditional and with um, with social media and we get you know we get pretty good coverage of course you never quite know what that really means as we've said earlier on in terms of real impact and so on it's there's no question that authors like it um, authors like being phoned up for interviews about their research uh, helps them to get the message across even more effectively so I think in, in, in terms of bringing the media to authors uh, it's worth doing Okay. And the final question, in everyone's experience on the panel, um, do you think publishers do enough to promote individual papers after publication? Um, I mean, I would say that I, I don't have particularly much knowledge about what the publisher has done with my papers. Um, I do know that sometimes pieces are being written about it, um, but I don't know if it's a publisher promoting that or if it's actually just individual authors like, oh, I would like to write a piece about that. Um, I usually just use the exposure that the journal gives me basically from being on the website. So there are ways to be a promoted, well, not promoted, but a, a hot paper or a must read paper or your, a cover piece paper. Um, but I'm not 100% aware of that. Something that we try to get when submitting the paper or something that the publisher has given us to get more um, exposure. Okay. Dr. Lee, do you have an opinion on that? I don't, I don't know. I don't know because once the people publish in the journal, so it's it published, everyone can access it. I don't know how publisher can still promote a special paper other than already published it. So, so no idea. Okay. Um, Roger, you're yes. with your two hacks on, what do, you, what do you think? Well, I think increasingly, if I was speaking as a researcher, I would be looking at uh, public uh, journal websites to see if they, what they do to promote uh, papers and I would begin to use that as a criterion for submission. I think there's a whole lot of things you look at it, uh, about a journal and I think that, that would be a quite a, a powerful additional few paragraphs if you explained to authors what you would do to papers that you, you know, to promote papers that you, that you, you publish. And I think that would be an attraction uh, to authors to submit to the journal. Um, I, I, I mentioned what we did earlier and I think we probably do as much as we reasonably can. Um, uh, but I think that most publishers don't. I suspect that most publishers think once the paper's been published, that's it. Uh, and their responsibilities end there. I think that's a short-sighted view, both in terms of the benefits that would accrue to, pay to, um, to authors and to the, um, the publication. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? I know there was a question earlier, earlier about Dora. Mm -hmm. And it was a question for the panel when we were talking about impact factors. Obviously, a lot of the big publishers have actually signed the declaration, the declaration on research assessment or shortened form as Dora, um, which means that they do not promote the impact factor without actually promoting other metrics with the impact factor. So trying to move away from, I hate to say this, but the impact of the impact factor number. So I think um, as Michael Brown asked the question, I think we should cover that if um, Roger, you would like to speak to that before we close. Sure, well, we've signed up to Dora. Uh, I think it's a very sensible direction of travel. Um, it also linked into um, Plan S because it's not just about the impact factor, it's also about open access. Uh, so that I think um, it, it's, it's worth reading and it makes, it makes good sense. Um, of course, it's one thing for publishers to sign up to that. It's another thing for people that assess research quality to agree with it. And I think that there's going to be quite a, it's 
quite a lag period before university panels give up looking at the impact factor as a quick and I'm afraid rather dirty method of assessing the value of research. Okay, thank you. I think on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much to our panelists and thank you to our audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.